Hi, my name is John Worley. I live in Beaufort and I'm a, uh, a writer. I was a lawyer. I did that for 40 some years. But uh, in my mid 40s, started writing pretty seriously and have continued that up till now. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you. And in contemplating what I was going to do today, I was given essentially a blank check to talk about anything I wanted to talk about, which is always dangerous for a writer. Um, I've written, uh, I have five published novels and one nonfiction book and some published essays. And I could read from my own work, but I decided today that I want to spend most of my time focused on the work of other people. And I think that's important from an arts and cultural standpoint because there's a reason writers choose to write. And one of the most frequent reasons, I think, and certainly in my case, is they've read something that really inspired them or elevated them or wowed them or uh, had a profound insight for them. There are all sorts of reasons why uh, literature, prose, and poetry speaks to you. And I thought it might be fun today to select a few things that have spoken to me over the years and things I keep coming back to to read again for additional inspiration. So I'm going to start off with a piece by, uh, from one of my favorite novels of all time, Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Joseph Conrad used in much of his work a, a narrator named Marlowe. And uh, in this particular, this, is, this sets a scene. And every time I read this paragraph, I have a vivid image of Marlowe sitting on a veranda in the late afternoon or early evening getting ready to tell this Joseph Conrad story. So it goes like this. Perhaps it would be after dinner, on a veranda draped in motionless foliage and crowned with flowers, in the deep dusk speckled by fiery cigar ends. The elongated bulk of each cane chair harbored a silent listener. Now and then a small red glow would move abruptly and, expanding, light up the fingers of a languid hand, part of a face in profound repose, or flash a crimson gleam into a pair of pensive eyes overshadowed by a fragment of an unruffled forehead. And with the very first word uttered, Marlowe's body, extended at rest in the seat, would become very still, as though his spirit had winged its way back into the lapse of time and were speaking through his lips from the past. I get such a great mental image of that every time I read it. Sometimes we read for inspiration and as to what might be. And one of my favorite quotes in that regard is from Flaubert's Madame Bovary. Um, he says, Human speech is like a cracked kettle on which we tap crude rhythms for bears to dance to, while we long to make music that will melt the stars. That's probably one of the most famous quotes in literature, but it doesn't diminish its impact to me, and I hope to you as well. Sometimes we read prose for reflections contained in it for, for self-awareness and awareness of one's life. And one of my favorite quotes in that regard comes from Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. She's looking out onto a, an ocean uh, and she's reflecting on her own life. And she's trying to contemplate being in that moment. And she says, she had known happiness, exquisite happiness, intense happiness, and it silvered the rough waves a little more brightly as daylight faded, 
And the blue went out of the sea, and it rolled in waves of pure lemon, which curved and swelled and broke upon the beach. And the ecstasy burst in her eyes, and waves of pure delight raced over the floor of her mind, and she felt, it is enough. It is enough. I find that such a powerful uh, paragraph of utter contentment. And in these troubled times we live in today, maybe we should all reflect a little bit more on, on the contentment that we feel in our lives. The other inspiration you can get from words, obviously other than prose, is poetry. And some of the best poetry speaks to me like it does, I think, to most writers. Most writers would tell you that to be a serious writer, you really need to read and, and understand poetry, not, maybe not some of the murky, uh, esoteric stuff that, that's out there from time to time, but something that's more uh, uh, accessible. And I've always, I, I'm inspired by this one uh, that's an excerpt from a William Carlos Williams poem. It says, My heart rouses, thinking to bring you news of something that concerns you and concerns many men. Look at what passes for the new. You will not find it there, but in despised poems. It is difficult to get the news from poems, Yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Wow. Okay. And poetry can also be extremely effective in telling a story. And one of the best stories that I've come across in a poetry format is from South Carolina's own James Dickey. Dickey was a terrific poet. He wrote with power. He wrote with, uh, he, his poems were accessible. And this one has always uh, stuck with me. It's a little longer than what I've been reading to you today, but I think it's nevertheless compelling. It's called The Leap. The only thing I have of Jane McNaughton is one instant of a dancing class dance. She was the fastest runner in the seventh grade, my scrapbook says, even when boys were beginning to be as big as the girls. But I do not have her running in my mind. Though Frances Lane is there, Agnes Fraser, fat Betty Lou Black in the Boys Against Girls relays we ran at recess. She must have run like the other girls, with her skirts tucked up so they would be like bloomers, but I cannot tell. That part of her is gone. What I do have is when she came with the hem of her skirt where it should be for a young lady into the annual dance of the dancing class we all hated. And with a light, grave leap, jumped up and touched the end of one of the paper ring decorations to see if she could reach it. She could. And reach me now as well hanging in my mind from a brown chain of brittle paper, thin and muscular, wide mouth, eager to prove whatever it proves when you leap in a new dress, a new mother, a womanhood, among the boys whom you easily left in the dust of the passionless playground. If I said I saw in the paper where Jane McNaughton Hill, mother of four, leapt to her death from a window of a downtown hotel, and that her body crushed in the top of a parked taxi, and that I held without trembling a picture of her lying cradled in that papery steel as though lying in the grass, one shoe idly off, arms folded across her breast. I would not believe myself. I would say the convenient thing, that it was a bad dream of maturity to see that eternal process most obsessively wrong with the world. Come out of her light, earth-spinning, spurning feet, grown heavy. Would say that in the dusty heels of the playground, some boy who did not depend on speed of foot, 
caught and betrayed her. Jane, stay where you are in my first mind. It was odd in that school, at that dance. I and the other slow-footed yokels sat in corners, cutting rings out of drawing paper. Before you leapt in your new dress and touched the end of something I began, above the couple struggling on the floor, new men and women clutching at each other and prancing foolishly as bears, hold on to that ring I made for you, Jane. My feet are nailed to the ground by the dust I swallowed 30 years ago while I examine my hands. That's a poem that I've read over and over. I recommend, if you liked it, you read it over and over because it's one of those things you get new meaning from each time you read it. And plus, I just find it emotionally quite moving. As I say, the reason that, one of the reasons that I write is because I've been inspired by not only what I just read to you, but many, many other things that I've read over the years. And as a writer, you would hope that one day you could craft a sentence, a paragraph, a poem, maybe an entire book that would speak to people in, in the way some of the great writers have, have done. So I'm going to close today with something I wrote myself. It's short, and it appears in this book, uh, A Southern Girl, which is a novel inspired by the adoption of my Korean daughter into a very conservative Southern family that was not particularly anxious to have any Asians in the family tree. And the paragraph I'm going to read to you is a comparison in the writer's mind between uh, an adopted child and a biological child. And if I can keep this book in my lap and not drop it in the middle of my paragraph, I'll be very happy. An orphan adopted at birth is not so much a mirror as a prism. Look at her directly and you will not, cannot, see yourself looking back. Instead, you will see refracted in facets cut by her unknown jewelers the pale inks and dyes of your behavior, culture, and station melded among and into the iridescent hues of her genetic weave. Trace the rainbow to its source and behold nothing more varied than the san a sanctified shaft of light, God's random sunshine beamed at another's cradle, but delivered by grace to yours. I've always been proud of that paragraph. So that's what I came to tell you today. Um, keep reading. Keep imagining. And if you're a writer, keep writing. And I've enjoyed it. Thank you.